Let me read to you a passage from the 15th chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 12 to 17. It's the Gospel for Friday of the fifth week in Eastertide. St. John writes, Jesus said to his disciples, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learnt from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. That's from John chapter 15, verses 12 to 17. It speaks of what I would call the ethos of love. You know, one of the distinctive features of the Oxford movement during its heyday of the 1830s and 1840s in England was the stress on religious ethos. By ethos was meant the moral temper of mind, the characteristic spirit or outlook of a person or of a community or a church or a society. The meaning of ethos can be difficult to define. Broadly, it means the characteristic spirit of an individual, a community, a people, a system or a civilization. The ethos of a person or a movement was itself, the Oxford movement men thought, evidence of the truth or otherwise of their position, and it also accounted for their position. This is because a certain ethos or temper of mind favours the acquisition of truth, while another ethos does not. A person, or even society, whose temper of mind was shaped by immoral assumptions and principles, was unlikely to be in possession of the truth. Conversely, error was to a point due to bad ethos. They thought that atheism, agnosticism, or religious heresy was due not merely to the rational processes which a person or society passed through in attaining to its conclusion, for instance, that there is no God or that there can be no certainty as to a God or that Christ is not God and so forth, but also due to the cast of mind, the basic principles and assumptions, the general temper of mind with which a person engages in that reasoning process. This temper of mind, this ethos, produced by various basic assumptions, will profoundly shape the direction of a person's reasoning. It will govern what he expects to be true, what he expects to be probable, and so what he will take, all things considered, to be true. And thus the ethos of one man will lead him to a radically different conclusion from another who has an entirely different ethos. A certain ethos favours the acquisition of truth, another the fall into error. The ethos, or spirit, or temper of mind, can and does vary enormously from one man to the next, as it varies from one religion to the next, and from one civilization to the next. It may lead a person to accept one religion as true, and another as false, but also a religion with a certain ethos will itself shape the spirit or ethos of a person. A Christian civilization will have a different ethos from, say, an Islamic civilization. I say all this by way of introduction to our Gospel today. If we were to speak of the ethos of the Christian religion, at the forefront of any description of it would be love. A Christian, if his religion has truly shaped his mind and his life, is a man whose whole cast of mind supports a reign or civilization of love. The love that he envisages and constantly assumes to be the ideal of life and action is not just any kind of love, but 
the love that is exemplified and embodied in the historical figure of Jesus Christ. It is the image and thought of Christ which forms his basic assumptions and provides his foremost motives. It shapes the temper of mind with which he approaches the various issues of life and it governs his response to practical problems. If he is gravely insulted, he will tend to forgive, at least he will try to forgive, because he will have before him the image of Jesus Christ. This will be the spirit in which he will approach daily life, his temper of mind, his characteristic outlook, his ethos, the ethos of his life. He will probably say too that this very ethos favours the acquisition of truth. If he is a man of Christian love, he is much more likely to attain religious truth, at least in the fundamental matters of life, than if his ethos were totally at variance with this. On the other hand, a man of a very different set of religious beliefs, with his very different ethos, will have a very different response to insult and injury. He may regard it as divinely preferable to return the injury in kind. An entire society with such an ethos, such a temper of mind, may respond with open anger and injury to injury that is received, and so, and do so with the utmost, with the clearest conscience. Ethos is indeed a most important factor in the life of individuals, societies and civilizations. The point here, though, is that we have a clear idea of the ethos of the Christian religion. It is one of love, Christian love, the love of Jesus Christ. So it is that in our Gospel today, our Lord tells us that my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. In John chapter 15, verse 12 to 17. The ground rule of the Christian religion is that love must be the governing principle of the whole of life, be it individual, social or religious. It is love according to the mind and life of Jesus Christ which is to be our all-embracing motive. The mission of the Church and of each Christian is to introduce this as profoundly as possible into the life of the world so that more and more a civilization of love grows. Society's ethos ought to become more and more imbued with the mind of Christ. And thus do we all advance towards the goal of being truly children of our Heavenly Father.